Um, <clears throat> good evening. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, I can't tell you how pleased we are to be back here at the National doing this show again, which we haven't done since 2019 um, due to some problems um, <laughs> that many of you will have appreciated. Um, no, we couldn't do it because of COVID, and eventually now we can do it because everything's back to normal and the country's running fine. <laughs> uh, it's, been, it's been an extraordinary year, um, and Private Eye has covered it um, uh, in the pages of the magazine and now in the pages of the annual, which we produce once a year, and this is our attempt to take it from the page and onto the stage. I'd like to think of this production of the year's events as our truth. <laughs> <laughs> I.e. we've made it all up. <laughs> um, so we will be doing that. There will be a signing um, of the annual in the Littleton Lounge. Sounds really <laughs> exciting. Um, yeah, quite, who indeed. Um, afterwards, so um, if you want to get a signed copy of your annual, please come to that. Um, this is the first time since 2019, and you will notice that we are one short on stage from the usual cast, because the great John Sessions is no longer with us. So um, a small thought um, for all of us that he's no longer here. But we do have an amazing cast, and I would like you to welcome them on stage tonight. Mr. Lewis McLeod. <laughs> Miss Jan Ravens. And Mr. Harry Enfield. Um, okay, so I mean there there have been a lot of problems this winter and we have a cost of living crisis. But the government has fortunately provided a set of top tips for getting through the cost of living crisis. Um, and they leaked these to us and I think they're going to be very, very help helpful. Join a car share scheme. Simply hook up with two or three friends and share your journeys and save petrol too. Mondays, you drive and they push. <laughs> Tuesdays, you push and Simon drives. Don't go to the pub. Simply organise to meet your friends in the local supermarket to buy some cheap own brand beer and start the party out by the bins. Cheers. Cancel your Netflix subscription. It's full of films you don't want to watch anyway. Simply watch films you don't want to watch on ITV3 instead. <laughs> It's free. Invite your friends round, pass the popcorn, own brand. Stop ordering all those takeaways. Simply ring up your partner and tell them what you want to eat for dinner. <laughs> they will cook it and put it in a plastic container and ring the doorbell. And no tip required. <laughs> Don't buy expensive food and drink. Simply buy own brand everything and then catch COVID. That way you won't be able to taste it. Quid's in. <laughs> Can't pay your heating bills? Just rob a bank and run like crazy. <laughs> That'll warm you up. And if you manage to get away, you'll have enough money to turn the thermostat up for five minutes. Mmm, toasty. <laughs> you could, of course, just come into a theatre. <laughs> I don't want to start off in a depressing way because there, there has been good news recently and it shows that some people in Britain are doing very well. This was the headline in a recent eye piece. Lucky Brit wins 200 million pounds. An ordinary British woman has hit the headlines over a jackpot win of a lifetime and the award of about 200 million pounds. The lucky lady in question, Baroness Michelle Moan, <laughs> recommended ministers give contracts to the firm PPE MedPro meaning they promptly dished out £200 million to buy PPE during the pandemic, most of which was never used, said the lucky winner. Oh, the nice thing is that it's completely <laughs> random. A absolutely anyone could have won this life-changing sum of money as long as they had access to the government's VIP lane, like <laughs> me. 
The multi-millionaire peeress said she would not be sharing the win with her family. I've seen, I've seen wild claims that my husband transferred £29 million to an offshore trust from the £65 million he made from the MedPro PPE deal for the benefit of my children and myself. But I can assure you that I have never met my husband. <laughs> nor my children, and I have never had any involvement with any of them. When challenged by a reporter who said that her story was full of holes, she said, <laughs> You should see the PPE equipment we provided! <laughs> Baroness Moan and her lawyers, who I've certainly never met. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll look forward to that. Uh, uh, so one of the things we always do in Private Eye is we record actual real answers that are given in quiz shows. It's a feature called Dumb Britain, um, collated by Marcus Berkman. And these are all real answers to real questions on real quiz shows, including The Chase, The Tipping Point, Mastermind, The Weakest Link, The Wheel, and many more. So, for ease, we've got a single presenter tonight, who is Bradley Walsh. In which century <laughs> did the Berlin Wall fall? 16th. <laughs> Solar wind is a term for a stream of particles em emanating from which large celestial object in our solar system? The moon. <laughs> Madchester is a term to describe the music scene in which northwestern city? Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> Name six famous Spanish people. Robert De Niro. <laughs> <laughs> what first name links the prince in Swan Lake and the war poet Sassoon? Vidal. <laughs> <laughs> a monocycle is a mode of transport that has how many wheels? Four. Which children's author was named after the explorer Roald Amundsen? Enid Blyton. <laughs> In May 2021, Christie's auctioned Waterloo Bridge, Ifay de Bruyère, by the French Impressionist painter Claude who? Van Damme. <laughs> <laughs> what was the name of the Mitford sisters' only brother? Emily. Who was the first man to walk on the moon? Louis Armstrong. <laughs> the fisher sozin attack is an opening in which board game? Cluedo. <laughs> Joe Biden served twice as vice president under which leader? Jeremy Corbyn. Fletcher Christian led a mutiny aboard which ship in 1789? The Titanic. The <laughs> <laughs> Who was on the throne when Tony Blair became Prime Minister? Queen Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> what part of a house is known in Cockney rhyming slang as the apple and pears? The toilet. <laughs> which 19th century UK Prime Minister had the nickname Dizzy? Dizzy Gillespie. <laughs> Which brothers, pioneers in aviation, are honoured in the USA every year on December the 17th? Is it the Marx Brothers? <laughs> what B is the nickname for the yeoman warders who guard the Tower of London? Border control. <laughs> <laughs> Dumb Britain. Um, thank you. Uh, we can't get over the fact that this year we have had three Prime Ministers um, <laughs> in one year. Um, and uh, fortunately, uh, most of them have gone <laughs> at time of <laughs> uh, recording. Um, but the first to go was Boris Johnson. And fortunately, we had access to Boris Johnson's last day in office in real time. And here he is, the former Prime Minister, but one. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry, I, I gave you a bit of a bum steer about Mr. Pincher. Uh, a poor choice of words, given the seriousness of Mr. Bum Pincher's bum pinching. 
Actually, du bois. And, and left you with egg on face. It turns out that I had met Mr. Pincher after all, and he was, in fact, a good friend and supporter and only occasional sex pest. Uh, I, 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 and I had said Pincher by name, Pincher by nature. Uh, top bozzer banter. <laughs> uh, still, I think I got away with it. Uh, oh, hang on. Sajid Javid's resigned. Cripes. Why has he done that? He's written me a letter saying... I'm a liar who has no integrity. And his point is, uh, <laughs> double cripes. Rishi Sunak has resigned. Uh, he sent me a letter saying, I have no integrity and I'm a liar. Well, no one's ever said that about me before. Well, you know what? <laughs> Triple cripes. Will Quince has resigned. He's written a letter saying he feels like a fool because I fed him a load of lies which he repeated on Good Morning Breakfast. Uh, what's going on? What's got into everyone? You'd think they'd never met me. And who the hell's Mr. Quince anyway? You know, he sounds like a character in Midsummer Night's Dream with Bottom and presumably Mr. Pincher close behind him. <laughs> I, 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 Multiple cripes. 21 other people have resigned. Still doesn't mean the party's lost faith in me. Whoopsie, pashupti, whoopsie, 37 more have resigned. Oh, the rats are leaving the sinking shit. Giga cripes. 45 more. Does no one know the meaning of loyalty? Even Michael Gove's trying to resign and is telling me to do the decent thing. All right, Michael, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> you snake, that's you leveled down. Super cripes are fragilistic Brexit allidocious. 51 other people <laughs> have resigned. Wah, is there anyone left? Gadzooks, I'm surrounded by ingrates. As Cicero once said, infamy, infamy, they've all <laughs> got it in for me. <laughs> I, 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 I now, oh, Sir Graham Brady says I have to resign. I, he's got the lectern out of the cupboard and says I have to make a speech tomorrow. Morning. Pwah, I won't. Nobody tells me what to do. I'm not going to do, do you here. Never. I will never, ever resign. Okay, I resign. I will. Pwah. And he's gone! Uh, not only do we cover public life in terms of government, but also in the royal family. Private Eye has a special um, interview feature called Me and My Spoon, which is an in-depth celebrity interview. We were very fortunate to uh, be able to interview the new Queen Consort this year, um, and um, uh, she gave us very graciously an interview. Your Majesty, do you have a favourite spoon Oh, gosh, yeah, I really like all types of spun. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for answering that question in such an honest and down-to-earth way, Your Royal Highness. Uh, I really don't have a preference. Uh, tea spuns for a cuppa, soup spuns for, you know, uh, soup, and uh, dessert spuns for puds. <laughs> have, have silver spoons featured prominently in your life? <laughs> I knew you would bring that up. Honestly, silver spuns haven't <laughs> bummed that much of a bug deal, although Mummy and Daddy had a few in the highs. <laughs> <laughs> now you're Queen Consort. Will you focus on spoons as a royal patron? Yeah, 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 yeah. I passionately believe everyone should have access to spuns from wherever they come from, you know, even if they're from Bruxton. <laughs> <laughs> that is marvellous to hear, Your Highness, and thank you again for sharing your cutlery-related secrets with us. May I say, it's no wonder that people refer to you as the Queen of Spoons. Oh, yeah, Raleigh, no, Raleigh, Raleigh, that's <laughs> too, too kind. Um, has anything amusing ever happened to you in connection with a spoon? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, His Majesty, uh, Kung Charles, uh, once uh, was eating breakfast, and instead of pucking up a spun to eat his boiled egg, he picked up a fork. It really was such a hoot. <laughs> that is the most hilarious anecdote in the history of kitchenware anecdotes, Your Highness. Thank you once more for agreeing to take on this task of, of being interviewed for this column. Yeah, it's really, really no problem. Thank you. Are, are, are we done? Have you, have you got what you wanted? Because I'm gasping for a soggy. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much to Camilla. Private Eye tries to offer an obituary service. We have um, a resident poet, a threnodist, who writes uh, celebratory verses for the lives 
of the great and good. And we start with, in memoriam, Leslie Phillips, actor and legendary screen Casanova. So, farewell then, Leslie Phillips, star of the Carry On films. Now, sadly, you will no longer be carrying on. You were Mr. Bell in Carry On Nurse in 1959, which is when you first uttered your immortal catchphrase, ding dong, <laughs> ding dong, which served you so well for the next 63 years. <laughs> but now, alas, the bell is tolling for thee. Ding dong, <laughs> dong. Leslie Phillips. <laughs> Obviously, Private Eye isn't all archaic Greek verse forms. We're, we're very concerned with social media. Um, and we recently ran a very up-to-date piece about Twitter. Twitter users have expressed their worry that the website known across the world as a forum for reasoned debate and calm, sensible <laughs> exchange of accurate information and informed views has overnight become the worst place on the internet. It's now toxic and unpleasant, tweeted one user at sadboy97 to his 17 followers. <laughs> as opposed to how it was before Elon Musk when it was a happy place full of nice people trying to make the world better. No, it wasn't, you wanker! <laughs> Said another user at TruthWarrior44. We spent a whole day screaming at each other about Donald Trump and Piers Morgan and Katie Hopkins. It was great! Another user at Contrarian Librarian added, Actually, you stupid fascists, <laughs> it was always a horrid place where disgusting people even put spoilers to Game of Thrones on, and I had to tell them I hoped they died of cancer. A fourth user at Elon Musk joined to say, Shut up, you pedos, or give me $8 a month. <laughs> at Sadboy97 summed up the situation by threatening to leave Twitter for the 37th time. I'm going to join an exciting new website aimed at young men in their bedrooms called Masturbate instead. <laughs> Uh, it's actually called Master Don, and I think we'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you very much to the cast for Elon. <laughs> we also cover sport. Yeah, we do. Um, and actually, um, now that um, I've, I've become very au fait with football, um, I know who Gary Neville is. Um, I'm very interested. So we've been collecting um, commentator balls, Simon Edmonds, um, at the magazine. And again, these are real gaffs and howlers from real football commentators. Uh, Conor McNamara said on BBC One. It's like London buses. You wait ages for one, then three turn up at once. And then you're away like a train. <laughs> <laughs> a commentator on BBC Radio Norfolk. He works his backside off, and that's a massive thing. <laughs> Martin Keown on BBC One. The club could have gone into liquidisation. <laughs> Lee Dixon on ITV. It's win-win, apart from losing. <laughs> Glenn Hoddle said on BT Sport. I mean, look at that. So cool, calm and collective. <laughs> Another commentator on BT Sport added... All of a sudden, you've got four or five seconds to make a split-second decision. <laughs> Matt Pryor said on TalkSport 2... He's going to need an ear to lean on. <laughs> Ian Dennis on Radio 4. Chelsea bowed out with their heads held high! <laughs> <laughs> a commentator on BBC Radio London. He's very tall for his height. <laughs> Tim Sherwood on the Kelly and Wrighty show. In hindsight, you always look back. <laughs> <laughs> Owen Hargreaves on BT Sport. Messi is one of a kind, but Harland is unique. <laughs> Commentator on Radio 5 Live. Fabio Vieira scored a late goal early on. <laughs> Nathan Jones on BBC One. Uh, it could have been a different game, but look, I'm not standing here saying it could have been a different game. <laughs> <laughs> 
Glenn, Glenn Murray on BBC One. He had one opportunity and scored two goals. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, from the World Cup, which obviously we have been watching, um, this was Rob Vickerman on the BBC Red Button. England really need to try and get some inertia. <laughs> <laughs> And the final word to a brilliant commentator on Radio 5 Live. Saudi Arabia would bite your hand off for a draw right now. <laughs> <laughs> commentator Moles. Uh, we are an international publication, Private Eye. We're not in any way um, parochial or niche. And we try, we, we try and cover world affairs. And... Um, this year, uh, Donald Trump's daughter got married um, and he made a speech. And we had exclusive access to that speech at Mar-a-Lago. My fellow Americans, <laughs> great job. On the occasion of my daughter Tiffany's wedding, it fills my heart with joy to celebrate the glamorous blonde whose big day this is. Myself, Donald Trump. <laughs> the 45th and 47th President of the United States. This is more than just a wedding to me. This is also an alibi for when the January 6th committee subpoena me. Because if I'm here, then I'm not flushing top-secret documents down the gold-plated John. Fact. Fancy the FBI coming to my house and looking for intelligence. Fake news. <laughs> So today, I'm not so much losing a daughter because the Donald doesn't lose. No way, no way. She was stolen from me, <laughs> just like the midterms and the previous election. This time, sadly, my candidates lost because of irregularities such as the votes being counted. <laughs> These candidates were my guys, and there comes a time when you just have to accept responsibility, you know? And I accept that the person responsible for this is my wife. It's not the first time Melania has made a catastrophic error of judgment. <laughs> so don't blame it on the Donald. Don't blame it on the sunshine. Don't blame it on the moonlight. Don't blame it on the New York Times. Blame it on the boogie man, Rudy Giuliani. Yeah, it's all Rudy's fault, as well as Melania's. You may now kiss the bride and my ass. Thank you very much, Donald Trump. Um, we don't only um, uh, monitor America, we monitor our own country, Britain, particularly the Guardian newspaper. Um, and the Guardian, you may know, has signed up a very, very exciting columnist called Adrian Childs, um, who some people like and, and others don't. And um, he's become one of the most um, influential columnists in Britain today. <laughs> he has. <laughs> and Private Eye had exclusives on the Adrian Childs Guardian column. There's nothing in the world I love more than beans on <laughs> toast. <laughs> in a word, truly scrumptious. Don't listen to the so-called gastro snobs with their fancy sauces, kiwi fruits, and French-style mayonnaise. What's that went into the home? <laughs> Took it into my beans on toast this morning, got me wondering just how many beans there were in your average small tin. Fascinating question to my mind, and one that, frankly, I've never seen satisfactorily answered. <laughs> So I got to counting, and the answer gave me a bit of a jolt. On the many occasions I'd given the matter serious thought, I'd guessed it a figure of around the 200 mark, but the actual figure turned out to be a whopping 212. <laughs> Though obviously it, it must vary a bit from can to can. Talking with some other mates the other day in my <laughs> local boozer, I got to wondering why zebra crossings are called zebra crossings <laughs> and not antelope crossings or dolphin crossings or some such. It's a fascinating question. <laughs> One of my mates pointed out that it was because the crossings have black and white stripes. 
just like the aforementioned zebras, if you will. Now it seems obvious, but it had never struck me before. <laughs> Sometimes it's the obvious things that you don't really notice until you do. Ladies and gentlemen, Adrian Childs. <laughs> We do try and offer, offer a proper um, notes and queries answer service to real questions um, as a sort of scientific feature. And this year, the big question was, who or what is a quarting? <laughs> who or what is a quarting? A quarting, as any physicist will tell you, is a subatomic particle released when a boson implodes after contact with a quark. It is one of the smallest nucleoids to have been identified by the Large Hadron Collider. The best known quality of the quarting is that it absorbs all known matter into a collapsing hole. And it's so dense that light can't pass through it. Some scientists believe that there is an even denser subparticle which imitates the behaviour of the quartet. This is known as the quasi quartet. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Professor Brian Coxman, Department of Astrophysics, University of Brian May, formerly Queen's College. <laughs> Thank you um, to Notes and Queries. We can't get away from it. The event of this year was the death of the late monarch, the Queen. And EJ Thrib and Private Eye had to come up with some sort of reaction um, to the death of the monarch. Um, people thought um, uh, it wasn't possible. What on earth would we do? We ended up um, uh, celebrating the greatest British institution of all time, the Q. Um, <laughs> and had a cover which said, God save the queue. There was a picture of Prince Charles on it, visiting people in the queue, saying to people, how long have you been waiting? And one of them said, not as long as you. <laughs> uh, Thrib himself ran a small poem, in memoriam, Queen Elizabeth II, 1926 to 2022. So farewell then, your majesty. You spent your life waving at us, and now it's us who must wave goodbye to you. Um, we commented on the flummery, um, no one does flummery like we do, and the extraordinary royal commentators who attempted um, to detail what was going on on television. This was um, our um, version of what happened in that Westminster Abbey procession. Um, there were various types of transport, as you remember, and various types of people on it, and the experts had to tell you who they were. This is the definitive version. So, on foot were Gentlemen Herald Tribunes Pursuivant. Regimental band of the Coldplay Guards dressed in traditional Paddington bearskins. <laughs> Her Majesty's Brigade of Archers, led by Eddie Grundy and Linda Snell. <laughs> Midshipmen from HMS Boaty McBoatface. <laughs> Queen's Consort's own beef eater and tonics. The Royal Canadian Mounted Lumberjacks Dismounted. Moderators of the Presbyterian T Church of Twitter. First Division of Chefs from the Household Carvery. <laughs> Chaplains to the Bishop's Move of London. And then in the First Royal Coach. His Royal Highness King Kong. <laughs> the Emperor Ming of Merciless. Queen Daenerys, Mother of Dragons. King Burger of Whoppers. The Life President of the Gilbert and Sullivan Islands. Then in the First National Express coach. The Duke and Duchess of Potato. The Dowager D Duchess of Grantham. The late Count Dracula. <laughs> and then at the end of the procession in the First Black Mariah. Prince Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Enough procession. <laughs> There were other royalty to be celebrated, particularly um, media royalty. And Dame Sylvie Crin, who is the eyes romantic novelist, produced a last very short love story this year. The sad tale of the marriage of Rupert Murdoch and Jeremy Hall. For the global media mogul, it was fourth time unlucky. And for the Southern Belle, 
It was a love that was destined not to last, unlike Rupert, who did. <laughs> it all started so well at the wedding. This is it, Leggy. It's till this us do part. That's the idea, Rupert. <laughs> you look a million dollars. Oh, I hope it's a lot more than that. <laughs> and the honeymoon period continued. We're really getting on. Well, you are. You must be a hundred. I'm not just a media magnate. I'm a babe magnate. And I'm hoping for a Jerry Hall. <laughs> but then, sadly, problems began. You've given me a new lease of life, darling. Oh, Fox. <laughs> <laughs> and it all ended in years, uh, tears. You're fired. Thank goodness I got a pre-nap settlement. <laughs> but the couple decided to be discreet. Let's keep our divorce secret. Good idea. I'll have Piers Morgan announce it on talk TV. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much to Dame Sylvie Crib. It was a year when former prime ministers just wouldn't go away. Um, and Sir John Major reappeared on the scene and got involved in a royal row. Fortunately, Private Eye has always had the secret diary of John Major um, as an exclusive feature, and this year was no exception. Thursday. I was not inconsiderably incandescent with rage when I sat down to watch the new series of the historical TV drama The Crown with my wife Norman. Hardly had the series started than the factual inaccuracies began. Oh, yes. <laughs> the opening scene with the Royal Yacht Britannia featured three quarter inch rivets on the forward poop deck. <laughs> when, in fact, as everyone knows, five eighths of an inch is the standard issue riveter for naval vessels with displacement tonnage greater than or equal to 74,000. <laughs> I was explaining this to Norman when she left the room to make a cup of cocoa. <laughs> When she returned, she had missed the scene in which Prince Charles plots to assassinate his mother by enrolling the KGB and hiring the jackal to poison her corgis. She did, however, catch the scene where I appeared and, according to the, in my judgment, poorly researched and wholly misleading script, told Prince Charles that I would instruct MI5 to assist in his matricidal plot. This is totally ridiculous and unbelievable, I said to Norman. She said, yes, they've cast that good-looking actor, Johnny Lee Miller, as you. <laughs> How preposterous <laughs> is that? I said, no. <laughs> I think that is in no way outlandish and is entirely credible casting. I wonder who they'll pick to play my Secretary of State for eggs. Will it be Pamela Anderson? <laughs> At which point, Norman unfortunately must have tripped over the remote control as she accidentally poured her cup of not inconsiderably hot bedtime beverage all over my head. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sir John Major. <laughs> time for another poem from E.J. Thrib. This time, it's more showbiz. In memoriam, June Brown, actress and soap opera legend. So, farewell then, June Brown or Dot Cotton, as millions knew you. You ran the laundrette in EastEnders. Now, you are lost to us, like a sock in a regular wash. <laughs> but where you are going, they are all dressed in spotless whites. You smoked endlessly, and now you too are ashes. <laughs> but still surrounded by clouds. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, June Brown. <laughs> um, I'm afraid we can't avoid it any longer. Liz Truss was Prime Minister <laughs> um, this year. And uh, she didn't stay too long, but luckily she gave Private Eye her farewell speech. Hello. <laughs> and goodbye. <laughs> Firstly, I'm proud to say that under my leadership, the Queen died. <laughs> and then the economy did as well. I know! But it wasn't my fault. There's no relation between us tanking the economy and the economy tanking. It is a coincidence that the pound hit parity with the Terry's all gold <laughs> coin. And we only did one U-turn, which was on everything. So it doesn't count. 
a bit like quasi quarting. <laughs> so jokes. <laughs> Look, everyone, serious face, I'm listening. They told me I was becoming a laughing stock, but that was good news. Laughing stocks are up. So I've stabilized the markets already, and more than that, I've united the party. They all hate me. I tried a charm offensive, but I forgot the first half. <laughs> Legend. <laughs> I said I was going nowhere, but I was wrong. The Lizzie is for turning. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Liz Truss. One of Jan's shorter-lived impersonations. <laughs> Glad to see it out, though. <laughs> um, Liz Truss did get to beat Zelensky. That was, that was just about it. Um, and we can't pretend there wasn't a war in Europe. But um, tonight, um, Private Eye is uh, making a charity appeal um, uh, on um, the issue of the Ukraine. So um, thank you very much for your generosity. Little Ollie Gark is only 59, but has tragically lost everything due to the horrific war in Ukraine. Through no fault of his own, Ollie has had to flee from his home in Belgravia and is now forced to find refuge wherever he can. We're asking you to open your hearts and give generously to little Ollie and his fellow victims of conflict. One million pounds will pay for his wife to feed and clothe herself <laughs> for a month. <laughs> Two million pounds will buy him a desperately needed peerage. <laughs> Ten million pounds will buy him a British law firm to prosecute journalists. One hundred and fifty million pounds will buy him a premiership football club. <laughs> One pound will buy him the independence and independence on Sunday. <laughs> Please give to our emergency crisis charity campaign now. <laughs> we'll be coming around with buckets. <laughs> uh, never. Um, the other thing that happened, yes, we had Liz Truss. We also had a new king which meant that Private Eye had to have a new uh, royal feature, a new romantic novelist to cover this extraordinary um, uh, change in our constitutional position, and a new series which is called The King of Troubles. Um, and it's written by a new writer, Dame Hedda Shoulders, <laughs> who's taken over from Dame Sylvie Grimm. <laughs> so, um, if you, I can just take you into the world of the new king. Charles was in ruminative mood as he confided in his oldest friend. One does so worry that this awful crown thingy on the TV will make people think I'm some sort of weirdo. There was no reply from the aspidistra in the corner <laughs> <laughs> of the royal drawing room in Buckingham Palace, where the artist formerly known as Prince Charles <laughs> kept his easel and watercolours. Your silence speaks volume. Charles was suddenly aware of the presence of Sir Alan Fitztightly, the, <laughs> the new royal pen pursuivant, steward of the Stinkwell, and master of the Mont Blanc. Mm. You're not talking to the plants again, are you, sire? I'm afraid the Aspidistra doesn't have security clearance, and the new prime minister has just arrived. Oh, God, not again. Dear, oh, dear. I mean, she really is. A... Charles stopped himself in mid-flow before the word appalling could escape his lips, and he would get reprimanded from his vigilant aide de campion for expressing an unconstitutional opinion. Your Majesty, may I present your Prime Minister, First Lord of the Treasure Trove, Amazon Primus Inter Pares, <laughs> and leader of the Conservatist and U-Turnist Party. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Truss. But instead of the awkward, curtsying automaton Charles had expected, in walked a small, dapper, Asian-looking gentleman in a shiny suit. Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> Charles muttered to Sir Alan. Hey, this chap's trousers seem to have stopped short of the journey to his shoes. <laughs> 
This is Mr. Rishi, sir. Sir Alan intervened. Oh, oh yes, of course. Yes. Charles blustered, whilst privately thinking, Who on earth is this Mr. Rishi? Is he one of those Commonwealth chaps? <laughs> yes, that must be it. I, I must have met him on a tour of the subcontinent when I visited the Hindu Kush and the, uh, the great temples of the Flujab. <laughs> Charles remembered what his mamma had taught him to do as she prepared him for the onerous duties of kingship. Have you come far? <laughs> <coughs> he asked Mr. Rishi brightly. Indeed I have, sire. As I said in my video, let me tell you a story of a young couple who arrived in a new country and made a life through hard work and sheer dedication to the... That's fascinating. <laughs> Charles hastily interrupted what looked like being a very long answer. And which Commonwealth country are you head of again? Britain, sire. <laughs> Charles was somewhat flummoxed by this unexpected reply. Jolly, jolly good. Beamed Charles. Mr. Rishi's family come originally from India, Your Majesty. Explained Sir Alan. Oh, what a coincidence. Replied the King. We used to own India. <laughs> it now belongs to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Said Mr. Rishi. Charles was impressed. Well, that's handy. Uh, perhaps she could lend us some money. Uh, apparently the previous lot in charge made terrific casualties. Mr. Rishi laughed and bowed nervously, his trousers riding up above his knees, <laughs> as Sir Alan hurriedly ushered him out of the room. Au revoir, Mr. Rishi. Or is it goodbye? Charles turned to his reticent green friend in the corner. Well, I think that went rather well. <laughs> King Charles and family. Time now for one of our another exclusive interviews, this one with Miriam Margulies. <laughs> this is Miriam Margulies, Me and My Spoon. Do you have a favourite spoon? Fuck off! <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> Silly me, blowjobs, am I on air? <laughs> yes, you are. As a leading actress, have spoons played an important part in your career? Fuck off, you <laughs> bastard! Oh, I'm so sorry. What am I like? You can't take me anywhere except up the jacksey. Oh! <laughs> Naughty, mischievous, twinkly Miriam. <laughs> uh, has anything amusing ever happened to you in connection with a spoon? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I once bumped into Stephen Fry, who charmingly offered me his spoon to, to stir my tea, and instead I put the spoon right up his fundament. <laughs> I'm a lesbian and I'm going to fart. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you very much indeed, Miriam Margot. <laughs> And um, we do we do tackle serious issues, and one of them is is the the number one key issue in Britain this year, which is immigration. And Private Eye revealed a new government plan to deter migrants. The Home Office has announced an innovative scheme to prevent illegal immigrants from landing on Britain's shores. The strategy, which is already underway, involves close cooperation with Britain's privatised water companies. The idea is simple. Britain's beaches are to be flooded with sewage in such quantities that a wall of facial matter builds up and prevents even the most intrepid of small inflatable boats from landing. Human rights lawyers claim the new initiative stinks. <laughs> but former Home Secretary Priti Patel is adamant that it will work. She said, This scheme is really exciting. We've been looking for a deterrent, and all the time it was sitting right under our noses. The current Home Secretary, Cruella de Bar Braverman, <laughs> insisted she would go ahead with the idea. You may not like it, but it's a lot less shit than the previous <laughs> Rwanda idea. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, news coverage at its finest. <laughs> Um, time for another quick poem, In Memoriam Anna Karen, TV 
and film actress. So, farewell then, Anna Karen, AKA Olive from On The Buses. Now you are, like so many buses, late. <laughs> but for you, there can be no replacement. <laughs> Let's hope there is room for one more up top. Um, thank you very much. Private Eye does buy in syndicated material, sometimes quite old material. Uh, this is a copy of the Daily Atlantis Telegraph, uh, which was found in the British Museum. It's about 3,000 years old, though it reads very like the Daily Telegraph <laughs> uh, today. The headline is, Atlantis hails progress at COP 2700 BC. The ancient Greek island state of Atlantis host of this year's COP 2700 BC, reported excellent progress had been made in the fight against rising sea levels. <laughs> the president of Atlantis congratulated the conference for a really constructive dialogue with realistic target setting and attainable goals. He thanked the leaders of Manoa, Mesopotamia and Persia for their commitments to slowing the process of climate change due to the release of carbon emissions following the discovery of fire a few million years earlier. We are confident that smaller island nations <laughs> like ours can avoid the dangers of excess flooding thanks to generous and considerate behaviour by the rest of the known world. I'm sure that with these sincere promises and pledges of long-term action, we can avoid... <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, thank you to Harry as the president. Um, I'm aware that there's very, very little, little political balance in the evening to date, and I'm deeply ashamed of that. Um, so, uh, no, I am. And for that reason, um, I'm very happy to bring on um, Keir Starmer, uh, the leader of the opposition. Yes, yes, he is. And... We have a, 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 a fortnightly Keir Starmer column, and this is the flavour of the sort of thing that you are going to expect. Hello. Welcome to my new column. That is, if you like columns, if not, it can easily be a think piece, a lifestyle article, or an op-ed featurette. Whatever floats your boat. And if you're not keen on boats, whatever floats your pedalo, dinghy, or catamaran. And if floating's not your thing, then sinking is absolutely fine with me. I'd like to get on to my main point, which is my utter disdain for Rishi Sunak, half-heartedly tying himself in knots in a desperate attempt to please all of the people all of the time. So you can see the clear difference between us. Rishi is wishy-washy, sitting on the fence and trying to be all things to all men. Whereas I am quite clearly resolute and steadfast about my desire to appeal to one and all. <laughs> I'm sorry, but if you don't like that, then there's nothing I can do other than modify everything I've just said into something you'd rather I had said. <laughs> like strikes. Of course, I'm fervently in favour of the right to strike. But at the same time, I'd rather you didn't strike if that's all right with you. So whether you're aboard a pedalo, dinghy, or catamaran, you can see the clear blue water that lies between me and wishy-washy Rishi. And if you prefer dry land, then who am I to disagree? <laughs> Vote Labour, if that is your preference. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Leader of the Opposition. Just a quick check that we haven't missed any of the major issues. Private Eye does run school news to make sure that we know what's going on in the major and minor fee-paying independent boarding schools of Britain. Uh, this is the news from St Cakes, which has had uh, a difficult term um, since the war started. Uh, sanctions term resumes today. There are three boys in the school, down from 397. <laughs> FSS Novichok, oligarchs, is no longer head of school. KGB Polonium, McMafias, 
is no longer senior prefectum. Either thermobaric missile, Vlad's, is no longer captain of war games. The master in charge of commuter, com computer studies, Mr. Botsky, is on sabbatical until further notice. He's been replaced by supply teacher, Mr. Hugh Arway, <laughs> who comes to us from the highly respected Beijing Academy for Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. <laughs> the sailing club has been suspended until further notice due to the school super yachts being impounded in Monaco, <laughs> Gibraltar and Bodrum. The headmaster, Mr. RGJ Kipling, is the subject of an unexplained wealth order and will be unavoidably busy helping the authorities with their inquiries. The school production of Dostoevsky's Crimea and Punishment <laughs> is cancelled due to a boycott by the remaining parents, Mr. and Mrs. Double Barrel Bomb. <laughs> the school concert, Tchaikovsky's 2022 Overture, has been replaced by a series of patriotic Elgar classics, including the Enigma Machine Variations, <laughs> Nimrod Little, and Land of Hype and Tory from, <laughs> from the pomp and circumstances beyond our control suite. The end of term for some cakes and indeed the end of the world for everyone else will be on November the 23rd. Thanks very much for some cakes for sharing that important information with us. <laughs> now, um, just time for another poem. Um, and because we've majored rather heavily on football, we're going for cricket. And this is, in memoriam, Shane Warne, the great Australian cricketer. So, farewell then, Shane Warne, gone for 52. You deserved a longer innings. The pavilion's that way, you pommy bastard. <laughs> yes, that was your catchphrase. <laughs> Warney, put your wanger away. That was the novelty record recorded in your honour. <laughs> you were the scourge of England, but now perhaps you are the Lord's favourite. This time, alas, the ashes in question are yours. Shane Warne. <laughs> and there's just time. We've had news um, literally just come in. The New Year's honours list, the Boris Johnson resignation dishonours list, has been leaked to us and we're delighted to share it with you tonight. Baroness Frutella of Tottington, aged 23, formerly Deputy Assistant Head of Wine Suitcase Replenishment in Number 10 Downing Street, March 21 to May 21. Lord Spaddy McSpadface of That Spad, age 22, formerly Assistant <laughs> Deputy Secretary of Song Selection on Karaoke Machine in Number 10 Downing Street, November to December 2021. Dame Mad Nad of Toady Hall, <laughs> age not available, famous romantic novelist and part-time culture secretary, best known for her books, The Beauty and the Bozzer, <laughs> Etonians Prefer Blondes, and the raunchy plans for the privatisation of Channel 4 and the BBC. Baron Stanley of Johnson, age 94, for his hands-on approach to gender equality in the House of Commons. <laughs> Lady Jennifer of Arcuri, 36, 24-36, <laughs> for services to amalgamating the IT and pole dancing industries. Lord Carphone of Warehouse, 02758, your call is important to us. <laughs> Please hold. For provision of holiday services on the island of Mustique to underprivileged and destitute former Prime Ministers. <laughs> and one rather controversial one just come in. It's Lord Fuck of Bollocks. Uh, this is formerly Paul Dacre, editor of the Daily Mail. <laughs> and the veteran of previous nomination lists for which he was rejected by the Committee for Undoing New Titles Sensibly, the C-U-N-T-S. <laughs> and there is just time, uh, just time before we leave you, to answer that question. I know it's been bugging you all. Notes and queries, what is a quarteng? What is a quarteng? 
The Kuateng is one of the mythical creatures in Lewis Carroll's famous poem, The Badenoki, which as everyone remembers from that famous reading by Sir Ian McKellen. Twas Kerry and the slimy goes. Did quasi Kuateng's gimbal dust. All Mordaunt wear the Tugend hats, and the Nadim Rishi's outgrabe truss. Beware the Badenoch, my son, <laughs> the flaws that bite, the boars that catch. Beware the Javit Javit bird and shun, the frumious Maggie Thatch. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Ian. And I'm afraid that is all we've got time for. We're being pulled off from the wings. They want to do Othello <laughs> in this marvellous stage. A tale of bitterness, jealousy, backstabbing. <laughs> no resonance for anyone there. Ladies and gentlemen, can I thank you all for coming, really thank you for coming and making the effort, and thank my amazing cast. Harry Enfield! <laughs> Jan Ravens! And Lewis McLeod. Thank you all.